One of the things I like about the book, and I'm doing shameless plugs for this book, Family Values, Reset, Trust, Boundaries, and Connection with Your Child. One of the things I love about this is it really gives some red flags, some ways for parents to notice, recognize when a child is hurting, when a child is having problems, because you start out by saying, we've got to have a baseline and you've got to compare your child to baseline. Right. I could come in and look at a child, even as a professional, and until I know what's normal for the child, I don't know whether he or she has deviated from some kind of norm, but parents know what that norm is. Right. Or should know what that norm is. Yeah, they should know what that norm is. You talk about in the book, part one is finding the reset button and parenting with a new lens. And you didn't write this book for the pandemic, but it becomes acutely relevant because of the pandemic. Correct, yeah. And you talk about parenting with a new lens. What do you mean by that? Well, I think many parents feel that they're stuck or it's too late or I came from not great role models myself. What good can I do? You know, I'm only doing what I came from. And that's what I'm trying to show them. It's not, you don't have to live with that. It's never too late. You can always be a better parent, even if you have an adult child. So it's never too late. And it's always should be invigorating to be able to reset yourself and look through a different lens. And that lens isn't going to come unless you take a good hard look at yourself and understand that where you came from doesn't mean that's where you have to stay. And many people say, and I'm sure you've heard it many times, I'm not going to do what my parents are. I'm going to do the exact opposite. But they end up running right into that and becoming their parents. And that's because they never looked at themselves and they didn't look at what they didn't like about what their parents did, understanding their parents probably did the best they could. And what do you want to do differently? And so that's what I talk about in part one. What can we do differently that's easy and simple to fix so that you can reset yourself and look through a different lens? You and I have talked many times about generational legacy. Right. We all grow up with some aspects of our upbringing that we don't like and some that we do. When you say parents have to take a look at themselves, you got to decide what did you carry from your parents into your parenting that's toxic. If your parents blew up and yelled and screamed and cussed and slammed things around and you see yourself doing that, you go, okay, this is a generational legacy. I'm carrying forward things that I lived with and I shouldn't be carrying these forward. And that's right. what you're saying. Let's look at this with a new lens. And you got to be willing to take a hard look at yourself and say, okay, am I doing the sins of my father? Am I doing right. the sins of my mother? Right. Am I doing right. the same things they did to me? Am I doing it to my own kids? Because I'll hear parents all the time say, oh, I hate it when my mother did this and I'm doing the same damn thing. Right. They run right back into it. Also, when they're being triggered by their child, you know, the five-year-old that's having a tantrum is making you angry, probably because that five-year-old in you isn't dealt with. It's looking at those triggers within yourself as well, because all of a sudden it's a five-year-old fighting with a five-year-old. Yeah, because you never move past that. Right. You spent 22 years at DCFS, and you said whenever you went to these homes, the biggest things you saw missing were safety and permanence. Correct. Emotional and physical safety and permanence. They didn't have a physical home that was safe and permanent. They didn't have an emotionally safe and permanent home either. Parents were immature. Parents were on drugs or maybe not. But there's lots of domestic violence and lots of issues that are being triggered in parents that are not allowing them to stay emotionally safe and stable for their kids and permanent. And then physically, they're not giving them a home or, you know, the violence that's going on around them. Now, this has nothing to do with socioeconomics. It has nothing to do with education. I know your practice, and you've got billionaires in your practice. You make it your business to see pro bono, indigent patients. You see them all up and down the socioeconomic and educational ladder. Homes where a child doesn't feel safe physically or emotionally is not limited to any one group, right? No. Absolutely. It has nothing to do with money, culture, tradition, nothing. It has to do with that person. 
And some of the most dysfunctional homes are some of the most affluent homes. Right. And some of the poorest homes are the safest homes. Yeah. So when you're listening to this right now, I don't want you to get defensive. And maybe you're a parent, maybe you're a grandparent thinking about what your grandkids are living with or kids in your church or neighborhood are living with. We have to take care of each other. And right now, we were talking about mandated reporters weren't there to look after these kids. You don't have to be contractually mandated to be someone that looks out for a kid. Correct. If you have a kid in the neighborhood, and I've dealt with situations over the 20 years of Dr. Phil where the neighbor had four kids, but they only ever saw three playing outside. Right. And after three or four years, they find out one of them's not playing outside because they're locked under the stairs. Right. And when they call DCFS and they go in there, maybe on their third visit, they finally hear some scratching and they go, look, and here's this one kid for some reason locked under the stairs and malnourished, et cetera, et cetera. So we've got to be eyes and ears. But it starts with you. If you're a parent or a grandparent, you've got to ask. He's talking about safety and permanence. Do the children in your orbit whether you're a parent or a grandparent, do they experience physical safety? Do they feel confident that they're protected by you, by the adults in their life, and that they're not in danger from you? And the same with emotional safety. You say it refers to a state that a child is given to live in where relationships have attachment, right? predictability. Right. They should be able to predict their parent is going to be there a hundred out of a hundred times. Right, the consistency. They need to count on that. Otherwise, the floor is always falling out. They never feel safe or secure. I did an interview today with a set of parents from Uvalde, and their child was murdered by the shooter in Uvalde. It's so interesting that This is right at the top of your book because they said, we didn't keep our child physically safe. And of course, they did everything Everything they they could. could. There was nothing they could have done. Right. But what they're holding themselves to standard-wise is they're saying, we didn't keep our child physically safe. We feel like she didn't feel emotionally safe because they think she was in there for 77 minutes. Yeah. And the children were calling on the phone for over 40 minutes to the 911 dispatcher, two phone calls totaling over 40 minutes saying, please come help us. Why won't you come help us? He is here. He's shooting people in the next room right now. Why won't you come help us? And they were just crazed. And helpless. Because of it. And they were saying, so we know she didn't feel emotionally safe. Right. She was probably saying, where's my mommy? Where's my daddy? Right. Right up until she got shot. I asked them straight up, do you feel like you failed your daughter? And they said, yes, we didn't keep her physically or emotionally safe. Right. And we open your book and you say the number one thing is provide yourself physical and emotional safety. Right. Now they did and think they didn't because of what happened. but. Every parent that's listening to us right now has the chance to do that. Yes, they do. They have the chance to do what you're saying. And I hope they do it. I really do. It's the beginning of everything, right? It's the foundation for every core of your child to feel safe. They just need to feel safe. But in the real world, when parents try to do this, the kid, you call it shaking them off, that they act like they don't want that. Of like, oh, yeah, I'm fine. Leave yeah. me alone. Leave me alone. What do you tell parents when they get the eye roll and I'm fine, leave me alone? That's a great sign. You're not supposed to be their friend. They're not going to like what you're doing. That's how you know it's the right thing because they're going to fight it and be resistant. So just stick with it. And eventually they learn that that's what it means. I love you. I'm here and I'm not moving. 